Hi, bro. Welcome. How you going? I am loving the Jurassic Park shirt. Straight off the it's bat. Yeah, yeah, man. Straight up. Straight off the bat, absolutely. So yeah, I'm excited. Yeah, straight to get from the wilds of Jurassic Park itself. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And so I was reading, you know, I was reading out to everyone that's tuning in um, a bit about you in terms of like a world traveler, outdoor enthusiast, nature guide, conservationist, photographer. Like, can you just speak a little more to, to all of that? That's quite the spectrum of things that you're involved in. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that sounds like some big boost to fill, man. Uh, mm. Yeah, so I'm, I'm here right now at, uh, at a place called Messerani Snake Park in, in Tanzania. Um, ah. Called Arusha. So it's, on, it's at the base of uh, Mount Kilimanjaro. So uh, largest freestanding mountain in the, wall, uh, in the world. It's also the place that everyone leaves from to get to Serengeti National Park. Um, and yeah, I'm a, I'm a photographer and a, and a nature guide right now, uh, probably more than anything. And mm -hmm. in that role as a nature guide, um, bringing people over to Africa, uh, mainly from Australia, but all over the world, uh, taking them out into Serengeti National Park and some other places along the way, which are really awesome, and just trying to immerse us all in in nature and get a really cool um natural feel for it so yeah, yeah man and tell me tell me why africa like why'd you choose africa out of all the places um actually we well me and my brother well our whole, whole family basically grew up in bamaga um mm -hmm. got a really good feel for living on the land up there and i know that you're also your family's also from up there right so um yeah, man, we, we grew up there and had an awesome time, to spent a lot of time in the bush with, with Aboriginal elders and islanders as well. And yeah. just got a really good feel for what it's like to be in, in the bush and how to make the most of basically all of your resources around you, how to live off a minimal amount. And mm. yeah, so basically to come and try and get a taste of another similar culture or cultures, Africa was, was always sort of in our mind. Um, yeah. So yeah, we've. I especially wanted to come over with my brother as well, uh, just to basically see the culture, but also we're animal lovers. We have our background to, in environmental management and ecology. So yeah, man, just basically getting over to see the animals and and I mean, you hear what it's like to get into or to to come to Africa and see the animals, um, but you never quite know until you see it yourself. So like, to come and actually just yeah, just to be around it every day is just a, it's it's mind blowing. Like it, it becomes it almost becomes normal to uh, to be seeing lions every day next to your car to to be having a great migration filing past your car. It, it's ridiculous. You've got to really pinch yourself and just me you know, me trying to get around seeing lions next to my car on a daily basis as normal is um, a bit of a stretch right now. But you know. <laughs> But is that is that what you're immersed in right now in terms of lifestyle, um, which is, just sounds radical to me, and I really want to speak more about that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, you kind of, uh, I've really like in the last six sort of nine months, even more, just been trying to immerse myself in this business idea of starting up a a really uh, down to earth expedition business that takes you anywhere in the world, basically. Africa mm. is the main focus point at the moment just because the animals are so incredible and and they're in your face and it's like wow factor from the moment you see them yeah so yeah it's it's become it's become normal but it's also been built that way but you know the the best part for me is sort of seeing it when when my my people come my guests come and and every time they see it for the first time i get to see it for the first time as well again and that's yeah that's a really, really cool thing. Like you can get quite jaded with work, even even with this as a job, basically. Um, mm -hmm. With anything that we do as, as work, you know, we spend five out of our seven days doing it at least. Um, for me right now, it's seven days, you know, and I kind of get pretty snowed under with, with some jobs. But yeah, then you're here and you're driving people around and you're explaining the African wilderness and especially as an Aussie to be doing that's pretty cool. So yeah, what an honor and, and to, to find yourself in that spot where you, you get to really explain and, and showcase 
I'm just in the middle of a lab. Yeah, where you get to explain and showcase the African wilderness to, you mm-hmm. know, and other Australians or other travelers coming in and how fulfilling that would be to be like, hang on a minute, you get to see it again for the first time, seeing their reaction, which is which is tremendous because I'm, I'm actually quite surprised. I didn't think that the African wilderness and that sort of role, you'd get tired of that or like you said, jaded. Um, that to me is a surprising thing. Like I thought, it, you know, I had this idea of like, oh, every day would just be, wow. And like, you, you can never get tired of that. But I guess, like you said, like everything is there's times where the consistency of it or you can get used to it, so to speak. Um, has that been the case? Yeah, it's, uh, to be honest, you're, you're right. It's not, it's not near as much. You sort of don't get so jaded of that part. It's more, it's the behind the scenes and the preparation work that's, that's the hard part. You can kind of get pretty stuck in the whole process of logistics and, and making sure yeah. the vehicles work. And then, you know, every time there's a little problem, it's just another, like, you take another hit, you know, and it's, it's quite... It can get quite tiring, um, especially in Africa. Things happen pretty slowly. Um, mm. So they're the things that really sort of that, that like make you take a step back. But at the same time, then uh, as soon as you get in the bush, for me, it's every, every day I'm in the bush is, is amazing. Like it's even better when you see it um, through other people's eyes. I get chills even when you said it before. I, I got a, a whole wave of chills about the idea of seeing yeah. it for the first time crazy um but yeah there's certainly days when like you just see zebra and giraffe and and buffalo you know and and that's incredible <laughs> that's, that's people have seen and i'm like someone that's never like seen any of that you're just like what? <laughs> but i can Where you know I can, I can see where you're coming from i did and you know i used to work on a cruise ship and it was a very luxury style cruise ship that had a small number of guests where we got into these remote places you know through papua new guinea new zealand and the great barrier reef and you'd see these amazing sights and i dare say you would you would fall into the trap of like oh i'm actually kind of used to this is my my everyday sort of thing it's like oh but when you see someone see a turtle for the first time or or get to see that volcano in in, in um, Vanuatu, and they're just like, "Oh, you feel the pulse of that volcano." It's like, yeah, cool. like, hang on a minute, like that reaction alone is enough to just trigger everything that I felt the first time I got to experience that. Right, that's that's ton of volcano you're talking about, right? Mm-hmm. It's an amazing oh. volcano. I recommend anyone. Um, <laughs> Just because, simply because I, my understanding, I haven't been to any other volcanoes, but my understanding is that the other volcanoes out there across the world, um, it's quite, yeah, it's like quite mm, constricting in terms of what you can see and do, and it's it's regulated quite well. Whereas that is just like I don't I don't know. Last time I was there, oh. the regulation is just, just it's just super raw. Like it's like you're up on a four wheel drive truck just going and then you just walk up to the pulse of it and there's like a lava rock that was created probably a day ago and you still feel the warmth of it and you just feel mother nature's heartbeat and you're just like yeah and it's like it's yeah. it's yeah radical to see the different pieces spitting out of it and to feel the the, the you know sulfur and all everything that's being like created you're just like wow i have a new respect i do <laughs> For sure. Yeah, I've, I've spent some time, both both my brother and I, and, and actually my folks as well on the last trip, have been to that volcano as well. And yep. get this, until I had seen the Great Migration last year, Tanner Volcano is the most amazing thing I've ever seen, the most raw, the most beautiful, uh, natural I've ever seen. Like it's, like you say, uh, um, just, just the explosions and the fact there's no regulation and you can literally sit on the rim of a volcano and look into the heart of the beast. And that's crazy, man. That's so raw. It, it Migration is, so raw. is even bigger for me. Like I never thought that would be possible to be beaten because of that, how raw it is. But um, wow. on our last trip now, two weeks ago, we saw a migration that was building up in the morning. Uh, was yeah, We left camp literally... 10 minutes down the road, we could see this wall of wildebeest walking towards the water. I said to my guys, we need to, we need to backtrack across the river and get on the other side so we can see them coming to us. So we left them and we we drove for 15 minutes without seeing an animal. I was like, wow, what are we doing? Like this feels really bad and I could feel it in them. They're like, no, what's happening? You know, are we going to miss it? And we arrived perfect timing as the wildebeest were crossing the river. And it just, it was an, over an hour and over an hour of crossing of just constant animal wall and the noise, 
the vibration, the, the the looks on people's faces in other cars, the whole thing just it's just a mind blowing. Like, yeah, man, your emotions are raw. It's cool. It's something else. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that would be. I mean, I. <laughs> That's cool that, you know, in terms of everything that you've, you've seen and experienced that Tana is up there and, and one of, as, as like in terms of rawness and nature, which we're, those that are tuning in, we're talking about a volcano in Vanuatu. I'll probably post a link down below or up in the description about it. And I believe there's a documentary now, a movie that they made out of that volcano. And then, mm. you know, Shane was just talking about the wildebeest migration, which to me, just feels like that would be an unreal experience. Uh, <laughs> that my little experience of that is being in Canada and you know walking a dog out in the mountains and then seeing the dog take off up up one of the hills and I'm like, wait, it just disappeared. And then next thing you know, the dog comes running back down and it's all these elk, just hundreds of them, and you feel ah. like a semi truck coming. And it just like it shook me up. I was so scared because I thought the dog was coming. He was running towards me, and the elk were following that. It was just like, oh my goodness. So I could imagine wildebeest and. Let's just talk in terms of numbers. What what's like a number if you could throw one out and estimate in terms of the wildebeest um, migration? It's it's a pretty hard one to guess. Um, <laughs> what I generally tend to do, and, and it's only sort of my second year of seeing it, so um, I'm new compared to other guides that are there and that have been there for twenty years. Um, I would have guessed that that big one that lasted for an hour fifteen, maybe an hour thirty. Um, <laughs> constant animals it would have been something between 40 and 50,000 so wow that's a lot that's well, okay. a lot so some people's like, lifetime haven't even seen close to that amount of animals in their lifetime let alone in an hour time span hour and a half time span running across like what an incredible yeah. experience is there is there anywhere else on the planet that something like that sort of sense of migration is happening in in, in that sheer size of numbers that you know of there are, there's a lot of animal migrations, and I guess the the way the humans have developed, uh, we've interrupted a lot of those paths. So yeah. um, not many of them happen as well as they used to. Uh, right. For example, there's a zebra migration that happens across Botswana that's just been kicking off lately again. But mm. um, that's like tens of thousands plus um, animals mm. moving. But in terms of actual like biomass of, of like the size yeah. of the animals and the intensity and the way that they cross nothing that really compares hey there's um there's a bigger mammal migration this is of this is of uh flying foxes or, or larger bats in zambia there's over two there's plus two million of them that move and obviously you see like the clouds of bats like it's like yeah it's like you see really bands cool. in some of the places in aussie but it's the whole like it's just insane the photos of that place is incredible um wow. i just missed that event last year but even when you think of like caribou migration and uh, pronghorn in, in North America and, and animals like that, um, there's nothing that compares in numbers wise. Like I was talking to some guys last week and they said it's a couple of hundred animals at once if you see it, if you're lucky. Um, but mm. nothing as intense. Like when, um, yeah, I'll show you the video in a minute and it'll, it'll, it'll give you a bit of a peace of mind of what's yeah. like. Got a video too that he, and, and just showcasing some of his work that um, we'll get to see in a minute. I want to speak to two two things in terms of migration. One was an experience once again back on the cruise ship I had. Uh, it was actually one of my first weeks, and it was in the Kimberley. So those that are tuning in in Australia, it's on the sort of the other side of Australia, opposite to Queensland. Kimberley is sort of an ancient part of Australia, not a lot of Australians even get to see. But I was along the coastline of it, and it was one night, and the captain. He phones up and he goes, everyone needs to get out of bed. It's like 12 o'clock at night. I just finished my shift. I'm like happily snug in bed. And if anyone has ever lived on an ocean before and slept, you know, the ocean rocking boat is probably the best sleep you can have. Like, it's just amazing. And so <laughs> the captain calls us up and we all went out to the top deck and he turned off all the lights. And it was like, ah, it would have been close to 100,000 of these krill bioluminescence. And it was like you couldn't tell the difference between the stars and the ocean that was lit up with all these bioluminescence ah. that, that were basically getting stirred up because the boat, the cruise ship was going through the water yeah. and, and creating yeah. this chain reaction. So it looked like kind of a scene out of Star Wars where you're seeing, you know, there's no difference between the bottom in terms of stars and the bioluminescence on the ocean. So it looked like you were going through ah. like this like galaxy. It was really um, something else. And uh, there's another, I, th- I believe it's a migration off like kind of Cocos Island in Galapagos with the hammerhead sharks and I've had the same dream where I'm like floating underneath the ocean and I see them 
all above and, and you know, they're just brushing through the, the sunlight that's leaking through the ocean. I will make that happen. I promise myself I will go see those hammerheads. Um, have yeah, you ever had, like, in terms of underwater and ocean experience with the with hammerheads or anything like that? What's some of the dangerous animals that you've played with? Because I know you played with quite a few, both underwater and on land. Uh, yeah, lots more, lots more underwater, lots more diving wise in the past. Um, pretty much since I've been to Africa, I've only done a few dives here and they've been cool, but not as much, uh, shark stuff as I'd love to like, same, same as you, man. I'd love to do things like hammerheads and great nurses. Um, and obviously whale sharks, which we can do in, mm. in WA pretty, pretty originally. Um, but the African stuff has been next level, you know, like it's, it's been all like uh, there was one one park I was in last year and my car broke down. Um, the starter motor had, had basically um, broken, so I had to get out and push that. But like 15 meters away out out the the driver's side of my car, there was two male lions and a couple of their lionesses sitting right there. So I had to get out and sort of be really clever about it and sort of even bend my mirror to keep an eye on them while I did it. And just get this little push start. Lucky it was a little Suzuki, so it was mm. easy to start. But um, yeah, man, pretty spooky. Uh, we've had nights where lions have walked into camp and hyenas have come into camp, and like somewhere I've been in my tent and I've only been able to hear them coming, so I've just heard their roars. Um, others mm. where they've just basically walked into the other side of the fire while we've been sitting there and spooked either myself or on my own or, or other people I've been with, and it's just like. Yeah, I've, I've had leopards in my camp and I've gone to see, I've walked over to another camp so I'd say hello to people, walk back and seen a leopard on the way back. Like that stuff is cool, man. That's when you realize like you're alive. Yeah. yeah you have to be really yeah. careful now. Don't make mistakes. Yeah. Your senses would really kick in. And I guess, the, uh, you know, uh, we're in a, we're in an amazing time in the world in terms of technology and, and like even having this conversation, but you know, another fall of that is that, you know, you get these documentaries where you see these amazing places and you see, you can see the wilderness of Africa and the deepest depths of the ocean. Um, I guess the difference between seeing it visually on a screen and being in it in the moment, in, in the rawness of nature, um, you probably couldn't compare, you know, at all. No, it's, it's really hard to explain, especially something like the migration, because it's just so full on like yeah it's not it's, it's not just watching it it's the sounds the sounds is probably the thing that's the most amazing but um yeah you can feel the energy in people in the other cars you can feel the energy in the animals that are also moving and not just are you watching them i'm, I'm looking at the screen like i'm i'm expecting to watch it happen um yeah, yeah, yeah. It's their life, you know, like that at that very moment that they're crossing the river, that's the most risk that they have in their whole life. Um, mm. Apart from the, the 10 minutes that they're born before they sort of get on their feet. The moment that they cross, they are so, so vulnerable. Um, and as mum's crossing with like five to six month old calves, first time they've ever seen it. And they are like Superman jumping into the open air. Like it's phenomenal at the whole, like, and it's not just, it's not just like it's a bunch of animals and they cross in a line or they cross all together. It's multiple streams. Everyone's doing something different. If you look, sorry for that background noise. That's, that's right. Africa for you. Motorbikes <laughs> and stuff. Fast. Um, yeah. But if you look at each different, each different channel of animals that are coming down to the water, these ones are jumping. These ones are just slowly walking in. These ones have got a crocodile about to attack them. These ones have just been chased by a lion. Like, it's insane. Yeah. Just can't explain it. Absolutely. And in terms of um, con conservation, where do you see the, the coherence or the, you know, the, the relationship between us and let's just take Africa, for example, heading towards in terms of the Great Safari and the plains of Africa and, and the wildlife there? Where do you see the, the human and, like, the dynamic of the relationship? Because I know... And, and, you know, I'm very fascinated by animal conservation work and a lot of it, like in particular, let's say with sharks or something that is actually changing the way we perceive it. So that it's more of like a tourism thing so that we can integrate um, and, and create a, a safer space. So it's not like the separation there, but it's also in a respect. And, and but what are you in your experience as well as where do you see it moving towards um, for sustainability and conservation? Yeah, good question, man. 
Um, that's a very complex one in, in yeah. the world and in my mind as well. I, I find it hard to to talk about just because of the different different environments in every in every country here. You know, let alone every single park is very very different to the next one. Right. Um, in countries like Kenya, for example, they're making a very strong stance on, on poaching. Uh, so they're making efforts to restock. They're really doing big efforts to conserve their elephants and their rhinos and things like that. Um, they did a, um, basically burnt a bunch of like, I don't know how many tens of thousands of tusks and so on it was, but several, I think it was five or 6,000 animals worth of tusks that they had confiscated from poachers that they burnt that they could have made money out of, but they took those then out of the, out of the, the, the trading stream basically. And, um, and just basically sent a very strong message out there that Kenya, Kenya believe in conservation and we will not mm. um, suffer any anti-poaching or any poaching. Sorry. Tanzania is also doing some great things, um, but they had a lot of their rhinos basically poached out in the 70s and uh, the 80s. Um, so they literally have 90 rhinos left in all of Tanzania now, which is quite sad. Um, yeah, yeah. But they're working on that as well. So in terms of the the message and conservation as a whole and everything, it's all money, honestly. Like yeah. the reason that people poach animals and they poach bushmeat and they poach whatever out of these national parks is purely for survival. Um, the people yeah. that do it are generally desperate. Um, the problem is the demand. So when it's something like poaching, um, the only solution to that is addressing it at the source. So talking to right. the people that are actually buying it in, the Chinese, the Vietnamese, the ones that are known to be importing these illegal products. Um, yeah. And are the one, they're the ones that are, that are inadvertently killing these animals, you know? Absolutely. Um, yeah, just to touch on that. Just to touch on that. Yeah, just to touch on that too. It's like sometimes people might have a distorted view and like, oh, you know, the, the culprits are the people that are killing the animal, but it's actually there in this form of desperate survival. Like this is my last resort and yeah. this is how I can make myself some money. And so just changing that perspective. And I know there's, there's the opening up the space that it's like taking those poachers instead of making them rangers. So protectors or whatever, and, and still giving them a, what, like being paid to be a ranger. I know is probably a, you know, a model that could be approached and, and things like that. Mm -hmm. So I guess I want to speak to speak to also what you were just about to say before I cut you off, but also more importantly, as the listeners tuning in, what they can be mindful of and aware of um, for conservation, not only in, in terms of like the rhinos and, and um, poaching, but on, on, as a whole, some, some mm -hmm. things that we could be mindful of. Yeah, sure. Um, like I said, the issue is super complex. Uh, yeah. yeah, you mentioned anti-poaching units being trained to to basically stop the people who are poaching sometimes that can be a conflict of interest because one can actually be the other um right. so there can be some some behind the scenes stuff going on there um right. in africa the the way it works is basically any national park or reserve or anything that's got some sort of boundary to it to protect animals is the only place that animals are safe anywhere outside of those they're generally um they're not so safe, you know. There's exceptions to that. Tanzania actually has lots of animals still living outside national parks in some places that are that are quite wild. And some cultures like Maasai culture are really good at, like they generally just eat their, their goats and their cattle. They don't tend to eat the wild animals as much, which is really, it's a really good respect then. Um, yeah. In terms of what people at home can do uh, conservation-wise, before you, especially if you're going to donate anything, before you donate, just be mindful of if it's a big company, you can't often define where the money is going to go. And, and a lot of money can go more to actually the running of that company than to um, conservation on the ground, which is quite a shame. Um, so I would say if, you, if you're going to donate or if you're going to volunteer or do any of those sorts of things and try and do a positive movement in terms of conservation, do your research, ask other people that have done it before. Don't just jump into something. Um, if anyone wants to ask me those questions after this, then I'm totally okay to answer them as well. I struggle yeah. to find a decent volunteer program that doesn't tend to fill someone else's pockets instead of contribute just to the conservation of something, but there are lots of good ones out there. So 
keep an eye out for those. Um, yeah, but the is, best is thing there, to do, I think, there you go. Is there perhaps one you could just drop off the top of your head that you know is, is like at the core of their message and, and their contribution to back to the one off the top of your head that you might have in mind? Um, there's one, I'm not going to, I'm not going to use names because I don't want to say yes or no about certain ones. Cause that's a bit of a, yeah. I can, yeah, yeah, yeah. Frankly, in my audience, I've got lots of people that work for, work for these companies. Um, but there's one in here, Tanzania, we saw the other day, I posted some Instagram videos about it, um, called, called Arusha Coffee Lodge or Shanga. And mm -hmm. they employ local, uh, disabled or, or handicapped people. And those people are employed to do all of the jobs of running this particular craft center that's a side shoot of the coffee lodge. And so they do everything from creating jewelry um, to local cloth, um, glassworks, all sorts of stuff. And that is all in-house. It's all free. Uh, if you want to volunteer for something like that, then look up Shenga or Arusha Coffee Lodge. And um, they're one of those programs that is purely about um, getting in there and working with the locals. Um, that's just one example. And I'd encourage you guys to go and try and find similar examples to that, where you can see that if you're a volunteer, I mean, you might pay for your food and your, your board, but you're not paying for someone else. So I've got a muzzy buzzing around me. Uh, you're not paying for, um, you know, you're not paying into a large organization and, and the running of that instead of the actual on ground results. So yeah, yeah, good. It's a, it's a really valid point to to bring forth, and you know I do believe um, that there is there is resources out there where you can look up the company that you might have an interest in being involved with and see the actual chart. I'm pretty sure it's they have to have a chart availability um, like somewhere in in terms of like on Google or on the internet where you see the chart of the distribution of of what they get and what goes to the marketing and what goes to the team and what goes back to the actual cause. So just being mindful of that, there are some good websites out there. Um, some of those that. are really good, but even, even so, if you've got money to pay someone to do or, or to do that in house, then you've generally got a lot of money. And so, yeah, yeah my point is, is very strongly do your research and find out first. Um, yeah. That said, the, the general conservation and, mindfulness of people is increasing by the day uh, mm -hmm. we all know about the global climate change and issues like that um, people are becoming more savvy especially with waste management which is fantastic um, the mm -hmm. more innovation we can get around that sort of stuff the better so yeah, yeah there's some really cool stuff going on uh, we just got to keep Let's... doing that and not yeah. force feed it Let... either no one yeah. wants to be told you're not recycling enough or you're not doing this or that let's just you know, do your own thing and try and encourage people, but don't force diets or any of that sort of stuff on people. Mm, let's talk in terms of innovation. What's been something in your in your scope or like in your in your world that you're like, yeah, that's rock on in terms of innovation? Um, some pretty ironic ones come to mind more than anything. Uh, for example, last year I just. I went into Kenya for a few weeks to see what the migration is from the other side, from the Maasai Mara side. And uh, I went into some shops and the shops there are awesome. There's heaps more available. But when you buy the gear, there's no plastic bags. They'd literally made a policy July last year, no more plastic bags in Kenya. And it was like cold turkey. They just instantly decided that's it, no more plastic bags. And now you have to buy bags when you go to the shop. So we're seeing a lot of that coming to Australia now, and that's great. It's not necessarily as tidy as it should be, but it'll get there. So I think we've got to be more happy with the, the intention than, than the actual change. But just the idea of switching things out, I think well, our main, the main innovation that I love is not even innovation. It's just a change of behavior, and that's mm -hmm. in, in reducing in the first place and reusing. Uh, before you even get to recycling, we should be using stuff. Uh, in that sense instead um yeah. the irony in the kenya issue was you, all the fence lines and all the trees in kenya are covered in plastic bags from people just discarding them outside of local transport so yeah. the problem is actually really huge and cold just saying no more plastic bags hasn't solved that but um but the intention's there and that's important so yeah yeah, yeah. that is important for sure love it love it 
Sweet. Um, yeah, I guess my, my next question is kind of like the iconic question I'm starting to create in each of these shows is like, for you, what's been a game changing moments that you that stand out to you that changed the way you play life? Right. Um, another awesome question. I've been I've been waiting for this one, mate. Um, and to be answer the to be honest, the answer is not super clean for me. But um, yeah, there's That's been right. several things. I never really pictured myself to be someone who sat still for too long. Um, so that's always been a, it's been easy ish for me to, to, to change things up, which has been cool. Uh, so there's lots of variety always, but, um, probably a moment for me was, I was, I was working construction, um, not living in my hometown anymore. Um, working four weeks on and one week off and not really having a social life, really having anything going on. It was quite tricky. I see Narelle, you've just jumped on this chat. You're experiencing that probably still right now. Um, but yeah, I just found that I was putting so much of my, my life and my effort into, into doing the work side of things. And then I wasn't having much of a social life. So I'd gone home back to North Queensland and ran in this race called the Great Wheelbarrow Race, which is like a 145 kilometer, three day pushing a wheelbarrow race. And oh, I did it on my own. I did it on my it's crazy. Nuts. It's, super, it's actually a really, really fun event. Um, you should actually compete in it some year, man. You'd love it. And it's from it's from North Queensland, so it's part of your blood. But um Sweet. yeah, ran it ran it solo. Uh, and I had some really good mates come and jump in a jump in my support car and they would run with me periodically and help me through. And it was one of those one of those real eye-opening moments to go, look at this. I have these amazing friends who I barely get to see and they're here to support me. I'm competing this really hectic race, really testing myself physically, but more mentally. Um, and it mm. gave me some time to think while well, I'm every single step was starting to hurt by the end. And it gave me time to think like, am I actually doing what I, what I really love? I still don't know what I'm meant to be doing, to be honest, but, uh, yeah. but it made me just realize, okay, I'm not spending enough time with my people um, I'm pretty much now doing something where I don't spend any time with them anyway. So I haven't really fixed that side, but the lifestyle is good. So what, well, I, what good. I did, was I, I basically put steps into place to, to resign from that position, um, started doing my research and I did, I did probably 12 months of research before I was sure it was the right thing to do. Um, mm -hmm. Quit my job 2015, purchased a one-way ticket to, to Africa and uh and bought a basically bought a place to do a three-month guiding course to get my nature guiding skills a basic qualification to be able to do this nature guiding that i'm now doing and um and did it followed through which is the most important thing and i think we we don't all do it yeah. I, I don't always do it but um it's cool to just have that perspective and go okay i need to change things again i'm, I'm getting comfortable uh, time to mix mm. it up and did it in the most dramatic way of like Africa one way ticket. Let's see how yeah. this goes. Talk about and I literally, I'd only thought as far as the course. I'd never, I'd not thought any further. But I finished the course ten weeks later, and then I was like, um, now what do I do? Hadn't even thought of what I was going to do after. Literally jumped in a car with some friends, jumped into Mozambique, the the next country north, and then yep. just started hitchhiking basically. Caught up with some more friends further north and then was like, okay, I need to buy a car. Otherwise, I'm never going to see the countries. And, um, yeah, and then yeah. self-drove Africa for, for a year and a half. That's why I'm here. It's just purely that decision to go, I need to get out of my comfort zone. I need to change things up. Let's go. Um, I love that. And, and yeah. you know, to me, what I'm recognizing as a theme is that there is those game-changing moments where you just make a decision. And, you know, it's a, obviously there's... Um, a lot more to it but really it's coming back to that that moment where it's like actually i'm gonna i'm gonna do this i'm gonna make the decision to do this and then the mm -hmm. things that fall out fall out of that decision right it, it, it changes the way you you're now going to be playing life in terms of like oh okay this is radically different um this might scare the shit out of me this might this might um you know this might be a little bit of stepping into the unknown and that's a lot of things as well is that we we <laughs> You know, I, I'm, I'm kind of obsessed with this right now where it's like, how much am I just living each day to my knowing thing? It's like, cool, I know that I'm going to go do that and that's the next thing and get up and eat that breakfast. And it's like, 
oh, how much am I just doing the same patterns of like just knowing? Like how much can I embrace in terms of unknown where I'm kind of breaking the habit of being myself of like, cool. And that's, you know, that's fun to stretch the comfort zone. It doesn't have to be a, you know, the, the, you don't always have to do that. But um, I know personally right now, I'm just in love with doing that. And um, mm-hmm. <laughs> it has some repercussions and there needs to be integration as well, which is cool. Uh, so, for sure. <laughs> Um, yeah, Shane, do you want to show us a little glimpse, if you wanted to, of your, your video now? And anyone that's watching, by the way, if you have any questions for Shane and I, just dropping it in the comments, if not after the live, which most of these people that are tuning into the show, um, after I've dropped the live and stuff, they'll watch it overnight or something like that. And I'll make sure that if they have any questions in terms of conservation, in terms of your work, what you do, maybe questions even about Africa, travel, um, that they'll mm-hmm. swing it your way in personal message. Awesome, man. Totally. Totally okay with that. Anyone wants to ask me any questions, easy. Yeah. Um, particularly, okay. yeah. Show us, show us the goods. I, I watched this um, briefly already, so I got a sneak peek and I, I was in love. <laughs> I was like, this is incredible. I want to be there. <laughs> yeah, right. So, so I'm, all I'm going to do is basically turn my phone around and show you my laptop screen, which isn't embracing technology isn't... these days. I know I'm not doing it, but I blame, I'm saying I'm in Africa and that's as far as I'm going to go. But um, <laughs> check this out. Check this, this out. technology section. seeing a phone with a phone. Right. I'm ready. If, if you're ready for this, the, the, the thing is it's gonna be it's gonna be a lot of a lot of uh, sensory assault basically. So be ready for the sound as well as the actual visual. It's it's mind blowing. Hopefully it's not too loud. Okay. going to skip it forward a bit so you can see what it gets like. Look at those multiple streams of animals. Like, Do you want to pull us in cow. closer? Bring the phone closer. So everyone tuning in, this is Shane's work, by the way, um, and his footage. Yeah. That's radical. How, man. how do you even know where to look? Like, it's just phenomenal, man. Actually, I've mm-hmm. got a time lapse. Check this out instead. This is another way to look at it. <laughs> and tell me, do they in that river there? Would there be crocodiles and all that sort of, or you know, predators? Ah, uh, yeah, mate. Yeah, there's, there's, there's. Predators everywhere. That's what I mean. When these guys cross, their lives are totally at stake. Um, the idea of, of there being so many animals mm-hmm. eliminates the, the likelihood of an individual to go. Um, or sort of, you know, you yeah. as an individual to go. It's like schooling for fish. Um, but, yeah, there's yeah. there's lions, leopards, and cheetahs all around. Uh, and there's crocodiles in that river, and there's a lot of them. Um, yeah. We actually watched one crossing where... Where we saw one crocodile take a um, take a female wildebeest, yeah. took it, killed it, drowned it, sort of thing, and it, it let it go, and then the the wildebeest floated downstream. And then, next minute, this crocodile comes back to the surface, sneaks back in, and smashes another wildebeest. Two two Ooh. wildebeest to one crocodile. God, that's not even a hungry crocodile. That's just. That's like ghosts in the darkness hunting for a bit of fun. And, you know, they all eat them. So there's no waste. That's not a problem. Um, yeah. But, yeah, it's full on. It is full on because, the, you know, the way that they not only grab the wildebeest, but then they spin and they just, they're just spinning and the, and the dragging down. It would just be a very intense moment to witness, um, especially live in the, in the moment. Of yeah. The yeah. Normal. Sometimes you don't see it coming either. It's, it's crazy. Mm, love it awesome what we'll do now is um we'll start to wrap things up if anyone has any more questions or any questions just drop it in below like i said we also open up the space to like shane um and dunge dunge is his uh, nickname as i discovered <laughs> uh, on facebook as i was trying to, <laughs> trying to pronounce the name for so long um but yeah we'll uh drop some if you have any questions or anything, just pass it on to, to him and um, there'll be details in the description. 
Um, Shane, where can we find some of your work? Do you have a website, a Facebook page in terms of your photography and, and um, yeah, just people that can reach out? Awesome, man. Yeah, so so I'm on Facebook as, as Danger Ross, basically, but the best place you can find me on there is Shane Ross Photography. Um, mm -hmm. On Instagram, I'm at Shane Ross Photo, all one word. And yeah. my website is also uh, shanerossphotography.com. So you can check out them all. They're all named similarly, so it's easy to find. I've just written yeah. the trip report for my first trip this year. So a bit of a summary and lots of photos of what happened. Um, yeah, and I'm, I'm available on all of those. I'm on LinkedIn and all those different things. So if you find one, you can, you can ideally find the rest. And uh, yeah, love to help anyone out with any ideas. If they want to volunteer, then I'll try and point you in the right direction. It's not an easy one. Um, and if anyone is interested in either traveling to Africa or, or safaris particularly, um, hit me up. I can, if you don't, if, if it's, I can't offer you something, then I can point you in the right direction. So happy to Absolutely. do that. Well, tremendous value. Thank you so much for um, taking the time and um, having the conversation that we had today. I, I, like I said, I reached out and I felt like it was a great alignment. And um, yeah, mm. I, I know that there'll be some feedback in terms of the, the value and, and some different ideas. And at least for myself taking home, I'm like, all right, I got to get myself to Africa. <laughs> get yeah, dude, to Africa. come along. <laughs> yeah, I'll be, looking, I'll be looking forward to that for sure. Um, thank you yeah, once yeah. again. Yeah, thanks. Big thanks to you, man, for, for seeing that opportunity and inviting me in. Um, really appreciative. I'm, I'm real energized right now. Like that was a really cool chat and, and I think you, you drove it really nicely. So yeah, man, stoked. Mm, absolutely. Go out there, have some fun. I'm going to eat some delicious food and, uh, yeah, thank you. Everyone will put in the description to all of Shane's, um, work and his photography and Instagram all up in the description as well as what we discussed here today. Thank you for tuning in. We'll catch us next time. See you, Shane.